Hello everyone, my name is Mark Smith and welcome once again to uh, Online Sunday School at Red House Baptist Church. I'm glad you've joined me today uh, as we're making our way to the book of Job and then into Ecclesiastes. And um, I have missed a couple of Sundays and I apologize for that, but um, I've had some time off and Pam and I have traveled a little bit and it's it's been really good. In fact, uh, I just got back from Alaska and it was truly amazing. I wasn't sure that I'd really never thought about going and spending any time in Alaska. And a buddy of mine, Frank, he called and he said, what would you think? So uh, long story short, we got to go and we took, uh, he took his son, I took my son and then two of their friends. And it was just a great time together seeing what God's created and and just having a good time. I'm not really a fisherman. So uh, it was a new experience for me and it was really, really great. And uh, I'm glad to be back, but man, that was a great, great trip. Uh, while I was gone, several things happened and I just want you to be aware of it. Just keep uh, Donnie and Mary Lois in your prayers as Donnie's daughter and Mary Lois's brother passed away this past week. And also with uh, Brother Cobb's wife, uh, Benita, her, her mother passed away. So. Uh, I, I know they're out of town and uh, they're going to continue to mourn. And I just, I ask that you all would pray for each of them and that you would just uh, uh, continue to remember them as they uh, deal with this, these tragic losses. And, uh, but anyway, uh, we are, we are in the, like I said, the book of Job, we're going to be in chapter 36 today. And even though the focus is going to be on uh, verses eight through 23, you can see on that that I'm actually going to ask that we go through the entire, uh, well, at least start in verse one. Okay. I, I just think that's important. And I'll read through that in just a little bit. But the subtitle is God is just in his treatment of all people. And as we look at Job and his suffering, we've read so much about his suffering as we go through this and his not understanding it. Uh, but one of the things that we can understand, even in the midst of all of this, even if we don't know why, we know that God is just and God is in control. And we'll talk about that as we go through today's lesson. So let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Lord God, we just humbly bow before you and, and we ask, dear God, that you would uh, grant us wisdom, uh, grant us discernment as we read through your word today and as we study it. And as Father God, we just attempt to better understand who you are. Father God, we pray that you would give us the insights to be able to come alongside those who are hurting. Father, not to judge them. Uh, that's not our job, but just to love them and to, um, to help them as they suffer. And Father, we just pray that, and, and every one of us is gonna go through times like this. We just pray that you would help us as a Christian body uh, to be able to come alongside and help those who are hurting and, and Father God, just appoint them to you. Lord God, we thank you and we trust you and we ask these things in Jesus's precious name, amen. All right, so uh, like I said, the title of today's lesson is Justice Sought. I think I said that, maybe I didn't. Uh, but just as an introduction, man, who's that guy up there with that fish? That's unbelievable. Uh, so. What are some of the things about which you are absolutely sure? You're absolutely sure of these things. And a couple of the things that came to my mind early on was that I'm, I'm sure that Jesus is the Messiah. I'm sure of that. I know that he died for my sins and he rose on the third day and that he is alive today and that he is my Savior. That I know, there's no question. He is the only way to salvation. I also know that the Bible is God-breathed and can be trusted in all facets of life, teaching, learning, rebuking, whatever, we can trust God's word. Now, a lot of people say that uh, the only thing you can be sure of in this life is death and taxes. Um, and those are the only true absolutes. Still others pronounce their love as true love and never ending. And we could probably spend most of the day talking about this topic alone, about what are some of the things of which we are absolutely sure. Uh, so have you ever been given advice by someone who claims expertise, but you kind of doubted that? You kind of wondered, do they really need to be given advice about these sorts of things? Um, and all of us can probably say yes. And I was talking to one of my brothers uh, a couple of weeks ago about golf coaches and so forth. A lot of these PGA professionals, they switch coaches or they make a swing change and they go from 
this coach to that coach. And he had said that there, I, I think it was Lee Trevino that he quoted. And I don't want to say that for sure, but it was a retired PGA Hall of Famer who once said that I'll never take a lesson from someone who can't beat me. And I thought, well, that sounds about right. That, that, I kind of like that. I think it makes sense. Uh, but it doesn't stop people from wading in uh, to offer advice to those without first making sure that their own eyes are clear of debris. Did you get that? Okay, and it, that basically is a reference to Matthew 7, verse 5. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. But a lot of people, they want to jump in, they want to wade in, they want to give advice about things that they really may not know a whole lot about. And, and there's actually something about this picture. So uh, after the first day of fishing, we'd come back to the lodge and nine hours out on the boat, and we'd come back to the lodge and uh, I was sitting talking to some of the guys that were that were with us and a lady came up and she asked if, uh, uh, if we'd caught any fish that day. And we said, yeah, you know, we caught halibut and we caught some cod and that I actually had caught a coho uh, salmon. And she said, well, you didn't catch coho. I mean, you probably caught a salmon, but it wasn't coho. I said, okay, you know, I, that's what I was told. I don't know a, a king salmon from a coho salmon, you know, what other kind of salmon. She said, well, it wasn't a coho because they're not running this time of year. So you probably caught something else, which I said, okay, you know, that's fine. And then that night at dinner, um, there was an announcement uh, about who had caught the biggest halibut, who had caught the biggest cod, and then, you know, who had caught the biggest coho salmon, and that was me. So anyway, I, I just thought that was interesting. That was funny, because I don't know. I couldn't tell the difference. Like I said, I'm not a fisherman. But anyway, uh, let's look at some of the background verses in this. Like I said, I want to go ahead and read verses one through seven, even though that's not included in our quarterly. Um, and for those of you who are watching for the first time, I use LifeWays Explore the Bible, and uh, man, it's such a great tool, and I'm just, I'm thankful for them. But let me go ahead and read, well, the, here I'll read that in just a second, but chapters 32 through 37 is basically Elihu's response to Job's situation and his questioning of God for all of his suffering, okay? So he's all of a sudden, he's listened to Job, and he's listened to Job's friends, now he's going to chime in in these six verses, in these six chapters. So uh, let me just go ahead and read chapter 36, verses 1 through 7. Uh, I'm going to back up. Let me remind you what he said in chapter 32. And this is how he first addresses Job and his friends. He said, so these three men quit answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes, because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then Elihu, son of Bacharel, the Buzite from the family of Ram became angry. He was angry at Job because he had justified himself rather than God. He was also angry at Job's three friends because they had failed to refute him yet condemned him. All right, so that's that's where we meet Elihu here. So let me go ahead and read um, chapter 36, verses one through seven. Then Elihu continued saying, be patient with me a little longer and I will inform you for there is still more to be said on God's behalf. I will get my knowledge from afar and ascribe righteousness to my maker. For my arguments are without flaw. One who has perfect knowledge is with you. Yes, God is mighty, but he despises no one. He understands all things. He does not keep the wicked alive, but he gives justice to the afflicted. He does not remove his gaze from the righteous, but he seats them forever with enthroned kings and they are exalted. And that's verses one through seven. And I don't know why that thing pops up, but so be it. So uh, Elihu not only goes after Job, but he chastises Job's friends as well for not refuting Job and answering his questions. In short, Elihu was opening both barrels on these men as I read from chapter 32. But as we looked at verses two, through four of chapter 36, what stands out to you about Elihu's words to Job and his three friends? And it just, they just jumped off the page at me, okay? He says that he is speaking on behalf of God, that his arguments are without flaw. That's what he says, all right? Because they come from his maker. 
he is basically saying that he's a prophet of God. Either that or he's completely full of himself, or maybe both. Okay, because we know, you and I know why Job is suffering so much. We know that Satan is wanting to test Job's righteousness towards God. We know that. But he claims, Elihu claims to know why Job is suffering. Okay, we also know that Elihu's words, though many are true, they're not from God. Okay, what do we call a statement that is 95% true, 97% true, 99% true? What do we call that statement? It's false. It's a lie. And, and I don't know how many of you all have ever seen this movie, Liar, Liar, but here's an attorney that just lied all the time. He got paid to lie. And then all of a sudden, and I don't remember how it happened, but he couldn't tell a lie. Everything he said had to be the truth and just kind of the mess that that got him into as well. But anyway, uh, let's go ahead and look at today's verses and we'll pick up with, um, with verse eight and we'll go through eight through verse 11. If people are bound with chains and trapped by the cords of affliction, God tells them what they have done and how arrogantly they have transgressed. He opens their ears to correction and tells them to repent from iniquity. If they listen and serve him, they will end their days in prosperity and their years in happiness. So Elihu paints a picture of Job and other sinners being in bondage. They're in chains and, and they are in bondage of sinfulness. All right, And they are trapped in their entanglements of sin. And, and he's describing Job in this, saying that you have done this to yourself. Guys, does God punish people for their sins? And the short answer to that is yes, absolutely he does, okay? We know that from the beginning, the penalty for sin is death. We saw that in the Garden of Eden. We know that God punishes individuals as well as nations. How often was Israel uh, punished for their iniquities, okay? How many times did, did they refuse to heed God's warnings and return to him? And each time, what God wanted is he wanted them, and, and he rightly says this, uh, he opens their ears to correction and tell them to repent. God does that many, many times because he wants a closer relationship with his people. And what interferes with that? Sin interferes with that. So historically, how has God told his people what they have done? That's what he says in here is that, that, that God will tell you what you've done. How does he do that? Well, we know historically he used prophets to do that. That was their task. And each time they were ridiculed and they were detested for bringing news that they simply did not want to hear. But guys, they were ringing the bell. They were ringing the alarm bell of the fact that, that God had sent them to warn his people. And again, I have no idea why that's happening, but it drives me nuts. Sorry. So uh, each time the prophets were turned away and, and the people refused to heed God's warning through them. So what does Elihu accuse Job of in his transgression? And he does this uh, uh, in verse nine. He accuses Job of arrogance. You see, I find that interesting because Elihu seems to be the arrogant one here. Job is simply saying, I can't think of anything I've done. I can't think of a sin against God for which I haven't been atoned. I haven't made a sacrifice. I can't think of anything. He claims to be speaking though, and this is Elihu, on behalf of God. Whereas Job is questioning God, why God? Elihu says, I'll answer for God. Perhaps he thinks he's a prophet. But I'm telling you, that is such dangerous ground to be on, is when you believe that you're speaking for God. Now, I'll just go ahead and say this, that, you know, I've heard people say that, that the Holy Spirit has moved in them in a way that he wants them to do this, or he wants them to do that, or he thinks that we ought to do this. And, and I'm going to tell you something. Anytime the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit contradicts the word of God, that's not the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, the Holy Spirit, the word is not going to contradict the word. Okay? That just it's just not going to happen. All right. So so I would caution anyone to be careful about about claiming to speak on behalf of God. Let God's word do that. And there's plenty of it in here to allow God's word to do that. So uh, in what ways is Elihu actually speaking the truth here? And there are, I mean, like I said, 95% of the truth is still alive, but that doesn't mean that there isn't some truth in it. God does use punishment as a way to bring people back to him. That, that's, that's the truth. God wants us to hear him to turn from our sins and live in fellowship with him. He wants that. He, he craves that from us. He created us to do that, to glorify him with our lives and to be in a relationship with him. I just think that it's so cool that God walked with Adam in the Garden of Eden. That, it was that close of a relationship because there had not yet been sin. But you see, God even created a plan for that to happen as well, even after sin but it would be through his son, Jesus, that we have that opportunity and only through his son, Jesus, that we can have that opportunity to walk with God again. So is all suffering a direct result of our sins? So if God punishes sin, we would have to assume that all, uh, all suffering would have to be as a result of sin. And that's just not entirely true because we see that it's not the case with Job. In fact, Job is the perfect example of that. Additionally, we can look at the blind man who was healed by Jesus. If you'll remember, we just talked about this in, in, some, in uh, Vacation Bible School, but Jesus was asked who was to blame for the man's blindness since birth. Was it him or was it his parents? And Jesus responded that it was neither. His blindness was for that moment to reveal the power of God. And then Jesus spit in the dirt, made mud, put it on the man's eyes, had him go to the uh, pool at Siloam and wash the mud out. And then he could see. All right. It was an amazing miracle. I mean, amazing miracle, basically the same thing. All right. But, but it was to display God's power and God's glory. And that's why we exist. So, what is the danger in verse 11 if we read too much into it? It says, if they listen and serve him, they will end their days in prosperity and their years in happiness. Why do we need to be careful with that? And it's because God does bless the righteous with prosperity. But is it always in earthly terms? And see, that's the thing. Wealth and prosperity are not necessarily interchangeable words. Prosperity gospel often twists that concept and leads people astray from the truth. They think that if you're living a righteous life, God is going to bless you with an abundance of stuff, wealth, uh, of things. And that is not necessarily the case. That doesn't mean that it's not the case, but it's not necessarily the case. And, and conversely, just because people are blessed with stuff doesn't mean that they're righteous in the eyes of God. And, and that's the, the kind of the twist that you can get in that if you're not careful. And we have to treat God's word uh, very carefully. And, and that's something I, I try to be cognizant of as I teach this, because there's so many things I don't know. I don't want to claim to know things that I just don't, because I'm going to have to answer to God for that. And that's, that's not something I look forward to having to do. So anyway, let's, let's go ahead and move on. The next set of verses, verses 12 through 16. But if they do not obey, they will cross the river of death and die without knowledge. Those who have a godless heart harbor anger. Even when God binds them, they do not cry for help. They die in their youth. Their life ends among male cult prostitutes. And through 16, God rescues the afflicted by afflicting them. He instructs them by means of their torment. Indeed, he lured you from the jobs of destruction from the jaws of distress to a spacious and unconfined place, your table was spread with choice food. Yeah, right. So um, again, Elihu stumbles on some truth in these verses. What is the penalty for refusal to repent of sin? Death. 
Okay, so, you know, death will come from, we're all sinners and we're all having to pay that price, whether you paid it earlier or you paid it now, which is for a different discussion. So why do some people refuse to accept Jesus and repent of their sins? Just accept Jesus, repent of your sins, and you will be saved. Well, it's because of hard-heartedness. Oftentimes, people become so bitter towards God that they refuse to, to hear or recognize the truth. Their deaths are shameful, and they spend eternity apart from God, never knowing the truth. And a lot of that is pride. It's hard-heartedness, and it's pride. The very thing that Elihu is accusing Job of. So why does much of what Elihu says in these verses seem to be so sage and wise? And it does. I mean, you read through and you go, man, that's pretty good advice. I mean, he's, he seems to know what's going on because in many circumstances, they are true, but not in all circumstances. We know that he's misapplying these truths to Job. He assumes he is speaking on behalf of God, mistake number one. And he's really wallowing in his own pride, in his own arrogance, while accusing Job of the exact same thing. That's something that he's doing. Okay, so, you know, it, they sound truthful. It makes sense. It just so happens that he's wrong. He's misapplying truths. How do we avoid this kind of self-righteousness? and still hold to the truth of God, because it's easy to fall into that trap. Well, we avoid speaking with certainty about things that we just don't know. You know, that I'd shared with a Sunday school class oh, a few weeks ago, uh, someone had asked a question, and I said, look, I don't know. I, I don't have that answer. Um, and then we ended up through discussion, it was brought up, somebody had something with the translation of their Bible and a footnote in it that, that really helped. And, but you know, we, we cannot just spout off like we know something that we don't know. We do know. I know for certain God is loving, and God is forgiving. I know that God is just, but we also know that his ways are higher than ours and we don't always know why. And I put why there, I put why whatever. Stick with what we know, you know, stick with, with what we know about God as, and his, uh, uh, his identity, who he is, and then we can trust in that even when we don't fully understand things. All right, let's look at the last set of verses, and it's verses 17 through 23. Yet now you are obsessed with the judgment due the wicked. Judgment and justice have seized you. Be careful that no one lures you with riches. Do not let a large ransom lead you astray. Can your wealth or all your physical exertion keep you from distress? Do not long for the night when nations will disappear from their places. Be careful that you do not turn to iniquity, for that is why you have been tested by affliction. Look, God shows himself exalted by his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has appointed his way for him? And who has declared you have done wrong. Man, he's letting them have it. How did Elihu summarize the cause of Job's afflictions in verse 17? Well, he had become obsessed with this situation, that he had lost his, his wealth, he had lost his family, and he himself had been afflicted head to toe with boils. Okay? And, and He's saying, you refuse to see that you've been judged and you've been found guilty. Repent, that's the only thing that you have to, to hang on. What warning does Elihu give Job in these verses? And he says, don't be led astray. And he really smacks, I, I think, at Job in these. In other words, he's still accusing Job of sinfulness, as well as insinuating that the only reason, and he sounds like Satan in this, the only reason that Job ever trusted in God and was righteous is because God had blessed him so much. D doesn't, I mean, isn't that how Job begins with Satan saying, you know, look, no wonder Job loves you. You've given him so much and you've put this hedge of protection around him. Yeah, he loves you because you've given him stuff. Elihu's saying the same thing. 
Okay, remember that Job had been the wealthiest man around, and he warns that more trouble will come if you continue in this sin. I just think that's so interesting to see that, that when you twist words, which Satan is the master at that, but others we see throughout time have done the same thing. Finally, Elihu does make a bold statement about God. Who does he declare God to be? And, and I, I really appreciated the author of this lesson kind of laying this out, and I'll read you some of that, but he says that God is providential. And I'm just gonna read you this paragraph very quickly because I, I, I really liked it. It said, the doctrine of God's providence is the truth that he controls the circumstances of everyday history so as to work out his purposes. There is nothing meaningless or out of control in human history that God did not sovereignly ordain or providentially will. In fact, there are three things we can affirm about God's providential relationship to human history. First, we believe that God intervenes in human history. Second, we believe that God guides human history, even individuals' lives. To the con uh, Finally, we believe that God will bring history, even situations in our lives, to the conclusion he has planned. This is not merely an abstract academic or philosophical proposition, but lies at the heart of our personal trust in God's loving control over all things. When we experience difficulties, trials, or suffering, we might be tempted to think, where is God? What is he doing? Doesn't he care? God does care and he knows what he is doing. So that we can be sure of. And then I just, I, guys, here we are, 4th of July. Uh, I was thinking about the founders of our country and the things that they had said about providence. And that's, in, in, in that day and age, that's how they spoke of God and how things were in God's hands and God was in control. And guess, we should not have been able to form our own nation. We should not have been able to defeat the single most powerful nation on the planet. But as our framers, as our founders eloquently wrote, it's through the providence of God that we were able to do so. And that same God is, is providential today and, and can do absolutely anything. And I just pray that you put your trust in him. Guys, thanks for, for being with me today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day and rest of your week, and I also hope to see you Sunday. And remember, after our 4th of July service this coming up Sunday, we're going to have a picnic. Come on. We'd absolutely love to have you. If you haven't been there in a long time, come on. It's a great day to, to, to start coming back. Guys, take care. Thank you. Love you.